Here on planet Earth, we are familiar with our four seasons, being spring, summer, fall, and winter. But this raises the question, does Mars have a similar season cycle than ours here on Earth? What causes these seasons, and how does the seasons influence the overall climate of Mars? These are just a few of the questions that I will be covering in this video, so let's talk about that. To begin this video, let me go ahead and address the fundamental question of, are there seasons on Mars? And the answer is yes. Mars undergoes a very similar season cycle to ours here on Earth, which is just fancy terminology for saying that Mars has a spring, summer, fall, and winter in both the northern and southern hemisphere. So you may be thinking, that sounds about the same as Earth, and you'd be right. However, that's where the similarities start to end, because on Mars, the seasons that they experience are a little bit more extreme than ours here on Earth. It's so extreme such that we could see great variations in both the northern and southern ice caps, and the variation in temperature can cause global dust storms. So why is Mars's season so much more extreme than ours here on Earth? And to address this question, let's first take a look at what causes the seasons here on Earth, and then we can transition over to Mars. And I know what a lot of you are thinking. You're probably thinking, just explain what's going on on Mars. However, if we understand what's happening on Earth and why our seasons are a little bit more stable, it'll make more sense when we look at Mars and see why it's different. So to begin, let's talk about what causes the seasons here on Earth. And for those of you that are familiar with this topic, you're probably thinking right away, Earth's axial tilt. But what does that mean? As you're familiar, Earth revolves around its axis about once per day, meaning we go once completely around our axis per 24 hours, or approximately 24 hours. But this axis isn't completely perpendicular to Earth's orbit. Again, what does this mean? Let's show this visual. In space, we have the Sun and the Earth, and essentially, Earth is orbiting around the Sun, but in this case, we're just going to imagine they're standing still for a second. The Sun is our main source of energy, or sunlight, and as you can see here, half of the Earth is in sunlight, or essentially lit up by the Sun, and the other half of the Earth is in shadow. However, as I mentioned previously, Earth has an axial tilt, meaning it's angled with respect to our orbit around the Sun. Because of this, this changes which part of the Sun is actually influencing the surface of Earth. Or essentially that's saying, what part of the surface of Earth is experiencing daytime versus nighttime. Now all this information actually explains why a summer solstice is the longest day of the year, and a winter solstice is the shortest day of the year. And this is because during a summer solstice, the axial tilt is pointed directly towards the Sun, therefore we experience the longest day. Whereas in a winter solstice, when the axial tilt is pointed directly away from the Sun, we experience the shortest day. Now it's also important to note that the Sun's gravity actually does influence our axial tilt, or how much we are tilted with respect to our orbit. However, that only changes very slightly, and when I mean very slightly, I mean it changes within thousands or even millions of years. So that's something we don't have to worry about. But that's very unique because that means that our summer solstice, our equinoxes, and our winter solstice aren't really going to change in our orbit around the Sun. Therefore, if we have another visual and we take a look at our orbit around the Sun, we can put four points down, two of which representing the spring and fall equinox, and the other two representing the summer and winter solstice. And these will determine what our seasons are, at least from an astronomical standpoint. So, for example, if we take the time between our spring equinox and our summer solstice, that will be defined as spring. And if we take the time between our summer solstice and our fall equinox, that will be defined as summer, and so on and so forth. So essentially, this information gives us how long our seasons are going to be. Now, how can we determine how long one of these seasons are? And your first intuition may be, Let's take a year, we have four seasons, so 365 days divided by four, which gives you around 91 to 92 days, and that gives you, well, the answer for how long each season is. 
And to be quite honest, that would be an excellent guess and you're really close to the right answer. However, in reality, these astronomers and scientists have to know the real answer. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, which gives us more insight to why Mars is not the same as what we see here on Earth. But a fair warning, I'm going to get into some concepts of orbital mechanics, no equations and no numbers, but essentially I'll be explaining some of the reasons why we see variations on Mars. But if you stick along, it'll make a lot more sense when we get to the end. So let's begin with this orbit stuff. Earth's orbit isn't a perfect circle, and you might hear that a lot, but since it's an ellipse, the distance between the Earth and the Sun changes at different points when Earth is in its orbit. And it just so happens, since it changes, there has to be a maximum and a minimum. And when it's at its minimum distance between the Earth and the Sun, that is called perihelion, where peri represents near in Latin, and helion represents the Sun in Latin. As well as when it's at its apohelion, in Latin, apo means furthest and helion means Sun. So again, we have our perihelion when Earth is at its closest distance from the Sun, and its apohelion when Earth is at its furthest distance from the Sun. Now, since Earth's orbit is really close to circular, the apohelion is just 1% further than Earth's average distance from the Sun, and the perihelion for Earth is just about 1% closer to the Sun than its average distance. So 1% isn't that big of a deal, but I know what you're already thinking. If Earth is closer to the Sun, we're going to get more sunlight and therefore it's going to get hotter. And that's a really good train of thought, because in reality, yes, we do experience more sunlight when we're closer to the Sun, but it's only about 2 to 3% as much as we typically experience. So the 2 to 3% more we're getting isn't that much of a difference. And again, you might be saying, but that does make a difference in terms of our overall climate. And again, you would be right. But it just so happens that when we have our perihelion, or our closest distance to the sun, is during a southern summer. So you would expect to see that during the southern summer, our temperatures get a lot higher than what they do in the northern summer. But this is where it gets more complicated. Because of a combination of a fact that there is a lot more land mass in the northern hemisphere, and the fact that at a perihelion, we're actually traveling the fastest in our orbit, this means that a southern summer isn't increasing its temperature as much because of a combination of the fact that we're going faster in our orbit, meaning a southern summer is actually shorter than a northern summer, and the fact that the higher heat flux that we actually get isn't making as much of a difference because it's hitting water rather than land. And I know, that's a lot of information to grab at once. But essentially, it's a combination of both being closer to the sun itself, and also the fact that when we're closer to the sun, we're moving faster in our orbit, therefore the overall season is shorter. Which means, if you're in the northern hemisphere, a summer in the northern hemisphere is around 92 to 93 days long, and a winter in the northern hemisphere is around 89 days long. So they're still really close to each other and close to that initial guess we had of 91 days. However, there is a difference, and that difference kind of counteracts the fact that we get a higher heat flux or a lower heat flux during this apohelion and perihelion timeframes. I know that's a lot of information to unpack. The combination of Earth's axial tilt, the distance from the Sun, as well as how fast you're moving in your orbit. And it just so happens on Earth, all that stuff works out. Because our orbit is very close to being circular, and the fact that we have a lot of our land mass in the northern hemisphere. Therefore, it just works on Earth, and therefore our seasons are relatively stable. However, Mars isn't so lucky. Remember how I said the distance between the Earth and the Sun varies by about 1% depending on where you are in our orbit? It turns out on Mars, that variation isn't 1%. It's closer to 10%. Therefore, when Mars is closest to the Sun, it just so happens to be a southern summer, which means the southern hemisphere gets a lot warmer, and vice versa. When Mars is furthest from the Sun, it just so happens to be a southern winter. Therefore, it gets a lot colder. And these really great temperature variations actually causes global dust storms on Mars. So that's one of the main reasons why we see these dust storms arising similar to the one that ended the Opportunity rover's life there. 
because of these very drastic changes in temperatures. In addition, we see the southern hemisphere having a much larger ice cap or maintaining a lot more of its dry ice, as I mentioned in this video. Essentially, this is because the southern winter is further away from the sun and a lot longer than a southern summer. Therefore, it doesn't have as much time to sublimate into the atmosphere. So essentially, all these combinations that don't make that much of a difference here on Earth play a major factor on what's going to happen on Mars. So the orbital mechanics and the axial tilt play a major role on the seasons of Mars. I know that was a rather long explanation for something that could have just been said, Mars has pretty extreme seasons, especially in the southern hemisphere. So let me know in the comments below if you liked the further explanation or if you'd prefer just staying with the more direct facts and being able to include more. But the last question I want to address in this video is whether or not it can snow on Mars. And interestingly enough, the Phoenix lander actually took images of these clouds. And these clouds, which are usually found on Earth, can represent when there's precipitation in the atmosphere that doesn't actually reach the surface of Earth. So it's thought that it can in fact snow ice on Mars. However, if it ends up happening, more than likely it will sublimate before it actually gets to the surface of the red planet. However, there are various locations on Mars where it can frost over with dry ice. So there are a lot of images from orbiters that show very interesting patterns in both dry ice or even potentially snowfall in different regions. But we'll just have to send more robotic missions or humans there to realize if it actually snows more frequently on the red planet. But with all that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video about the seasons of Mars. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.